the exact belief of the Buddhist uh, how, what are they in one God they are believing or not Another question what are the teachings of Buddhism do they believe in one God that's what the question is as far as Buddhism is concerned if you read the teachings of Buddha Buddha did not comment on God Buddhism is an agnostic religion agnostic means neither does the person believe in God neither does he deny God the person who believes in God is called theist person who does not believe in God is called an atheist but a person who's quiet is silent on the existence of God neither does he say there's God neither does he say there's no God is called an agnostic and Buddhism is an agnostic religion and the scholars of Buddhism they say that Buddha did not comment on God because when he came polytheism was very much prevalent and he thought that if he spoke about the oneness of Almighty God people would not accept him that is the reason he was silent neither did he say there was God neither did he say there was no God so he was quiet but the scholars say that actually he believed in one God but did not preach it because people would not agree with his teachings this is the basis of Buddhism The idea of like a creator, all-powerful, all-loving God is totally logical because if they're all-powerful, they can't be all-loving. If they're all-loving, they can't be all-powerful. Why? Because there's suffering. Now, if there's suffering, if there was all-powerful and all-loving, why didn't they do something about it? And it's one of the obvious concerns, and one of which a lot of times people lose their faith in an all-powerful, all-loving God because you just, you just have cancer, or you see your mother with dementia, or you have, you know, see earthquakes, you see so tsunamis, you see, or just the ordinary pain in, in this life, kids with cancer, or kids dying. So why does that happen? And they, from even, you know, this was uh, 1500 years ago, they said, well look, if there is a God which is all powerful, he's obviously not kind. Because if he's all powerful, he could do something, but doesn't. You know, if they are, are all kind and all powerful, they want to do something, but they can't. It's a great little argument, but in Buddhism we put that aside, because that is the person. And as far as the basic teachings are concerned, Buddha spoke about the four great truths. The first great truth was, there is sorrow and misery in this world. Second great truth, the cause of sorrow and misery is desire. Third great truth, sorrow and misery can be removed by removing desire. And the fourth great truth was, desire can be removed by following the eightfold path. And the eightfold path says, do not tell a lie, do not rob, many of which are same as the teachings of Islam. But if we analyze the four great truths of Buddha, the first one says, there is misery and sorrow in this world which there's no problem in accepting that point number two the cause of sorrow and misery is desire no problem with that the third says that sorrow and misery can be removed by removing desire okay and the last one says that desire can be removed by following the eightfold parts now if you follow all these four truths if we analyze the last two truths they are contradicting. The third truth says that sorrow and misery can be removed by removing desire. And the fourth one says that desire can be removed by following the Eightfold Path. Now once we follow the third great truth, that sorrow and misery can be removed by removing desire. Now once we remove desire, the fourth great truth says that desire can be removed by following the Eightfold Paths. To follow the Eightfold Paths, you should have a desire. So the moment you have a desire to follow eightfold part, where is the question of removing desire? So it's contradicting. If you analyze it with logic. Our, our sense of the world is dependent on our desires. Our sense of who we are is also dependent on our desires. And what the Buddha is telling us with the Four Noble Truths is you have to look at your desires. Are they leading to happiness or are they leading to suffering? 
Now we all know that the Buddha says suffering is based on craving. He has craving for sensuality, craving for becoming, craving for not becoming. Well, sensuality is what I talked about just now, is thinking about sensual pleasures, our fascination with planning, our next meal, our next trip, our next whatever the sensual pleasure is going to be. The problem is not the pleasure itself, the problem is our fascination with thinking about it. Again, you can think about tonight's meal for the whole hour and make different changes to what you're going to do, where you're going to eat it. The, the meal itself is not so much the problem, it's the amount of, amount of time that's put into thinking about it. As for craving for becoming, the word becoming basically means your sense of who you are in a particular world of experience. That's going to be based on a desire. And again, if you have a desire for a pizza, who you are is one, the person who will enjoy the pizza, and two, the person who has the ability to get the pizza. In other words, you as the consumer and you as the provider. That's your sense of who you are. And then the world around you is what is going to be helpful in getting the pizza and what's going to be getting in the way. And anything that's not related to pizza is totally irrelevant in that world. Once you've had the pizza, then the next, what's the next desire? Okay, you have other desires and there'll be a different you and a different world. Now sometimes you have conflicting desires at the same time, which is why we think we have conflict inside. And also have conflict in the world outside. But basically, this is what the Buddha means by the word, word becoming. And it's your sense of who you want to be and the world you want to have. That's, that's a kind of craving that will lead to suffering. Then there's a craving for no becoming. You get into a particular sense of who you are and you don't like it. You want to abolish it. In this way, and then that's craving for not becoming. Now the Buddha says we suffer because of these different kinds of craving. But not all craving is bad. Is the craving to gain awakening is actually part of the path. The craving to get rid of unskillful thoughts in your mind, the craving to develop skillful thoughts in your mind, this is all part of right effort, which is part of the path. So what the Buddha is doing is, with the Four Noble Truths is teaching us to look at our desires, realizing our desires are going to shape our sense of who we are, the world that we live in, and they can go in two very different directions either leading to happiness or leading to suffering. Now when the Buddha explained this part of the Four Noble Truths, he came down with again, the desire, the crave, the three kinds of craving, because those are the cause, the suffering that comes from them is a result. On the other side, the, the desire that's part of right effort leads to the end of suffering, and the end of suffering is the result. So you've got Four Noble Truths. Now, out of those four noble truths, each one has a duty. The duty with regard to suffering is to comprehend it. In other words, to understand it, to understand it so thoroughly that you finally don't feel any passion for it anymore. We don't think that we're passionate for suffering, but you look how people suffer again and again and again. They keep going back to things that make themselves suffer. There's a passion there. When the Buddha talks about craving he, he, and clinging, he's basically talking about our addiction to things that we've suffered from before, but we keep going back. So, so that's the duty there is to comprehend that, the fact that there really is suffering in that clinging, the things that we hold on to. The duty with regard to the cause is to abandon it. We see the craving arise, we should see it as something we should get rid of. These are activities that we have to do. Now our problem with these two causes is these two noble truths is we usually get backwards. We think that suffering is our enemy, craving is our friend. And as a John Sawat used to say, no, it's, you've got it backwards. You have to see craving as your enemy and suffering as your friend. A friend in the sense that you want to get to know it well, to understand it. And then when you understand it, then, it, then you can go beyond it. But for most of us, we see suffering and we want to try to get rid of the suffering right away. That's the wrong duty. It's like going into your house, seeing your house is full of smoke, and you put out the smoke. If you don't look for the fire, 
you can just keep putting out the smoke, putting out the smoke. It's never going to end the smoke. The smoke is going to keep on coming. You have to find the fire. That's what you let go of. You let go of the craving. On the other side, you have the end of suffering. And the duty there is to realize that. You do that by developing the path. It's something you actually have to bring into being. So these are the four duties we have with regard to the Four Noble Truths. And when the Buddha taught the three characteristics, one, he didn't call them three characteristics, he called them perceptions, ways of looking at things. And the purpose of looking at things in these ways is to help with these duties for the Four Noble Truths. In other words, you see that there's suffering. You want to see that this is, the suffering is something that's inconstant. Because it's inconstant, you want to perceive it as stressful. And when you can perceive it as stressful, you realize it's not worth holding on to as yourself. In other words, this is a value judgment. It's not worth clinging to. It's not worth holding on to. You should let go of it. Similarly with the causes of suffering. You, you see, okay, these things lead to something bad. So you have to see them as inconstant, i.e. they're undependable. They're stressful, something that you should not identify with. You think of your mind like a committee. And this, these are members of the committee you don't want to identify with. As for the path, okay, you don't apply the three character or the three perceptions quite yet. You actually try to develop the path. You apply the perceptions to things that would pull you away from the path. For instance, part of the path is virtue. And as the Buddha said, sometimes we are afraid to follow the precepts because either we feel our health will be at, at, at stake, or our wealth, or our relatives. And the Buddha says, you have to realize these things are impermanent. If you break the precepts and then they take you down to hell, you say, wait a minute, I did this, I broke this precept because of my mother. I broke this precept so I could make more money and give it to my mother. And what do you think the hell guardians were going to say? That's your mother's business. You've got to go to hell. <laughs> we don't care how noble your motive was. You broke the precepts. And so you say, even in cases like that, you have to say, I can't lie for the sake of my health. I can't lie for the sake of my wealth. I can't lie for the sake even of helping my relatives. You have to see these things as inconstant, impermanent, stressful, things that you cannot, are not really yours. Similarly, when you're practicing concentration, you apply the three perceptions to things that would pull you out of concentration, and things that would get in the way of your discernment. So you have to be skillful in how you use these three perceptions. So in, basically, it's important that you see, could the Four Noble Truths come first? These three perceptions come within the context of the Four Noble Truths. And so instead of just simply accepting things coming and going, the Buddha is saying, look at your desires. There are desires that will actually lead to the end of suffering. And the desire for awakening is a good thing. The belief that you can do this, that, that the Buddha calls actually a kind of conceit. I, other people can do this, Tan can do this, why can't I? That's actually a skillful form of conceit. Something that you should encourage. And so what we're doing is not just simply accepting things and saying, oh, it's okay, waves are coming in off the shore, good waves are coming, bad waves are coming, it doesn't matter, I'll just sit here and accept the waves. What's going to happen, of course, is someday the waves are going to come and boom, you're gone. And who knows where they're going to wash you up again. And the image the Buddha gives of the practice is not just sitting there accepting things, it's there's a dangerous river you have to cross, but you can get across the river. And you do that by holding on to the path. And you by making an effort. You have to paddle with your hands and your feet. You have to make that effort. But there is a place of safety that you can get to. If you get up on the raft and say, look, I'm not holding on, what's going to happen? You fall off and get swept down the river.